there were a group of students that were standing in line getting ready for lunch. And as they're standing in the lunch line, they went to a Catholic school. And as they're standing there, they get up to the front and there's this big basket of apples right at the very front. And there was a nun standing next to that basket of apples. And she looks at the boys as they're coming by. And she says, boys, only one apple. God's watching. So the boys get one apple. They begin to walk down the line. They get their other food. As they get their other food, they get to the end. And at the end, there's this big basket of cookies. And one of the boys shouts out, goes, guys, get as many cookies as you want. God's watching the apples. <laughs> Listen, today we're in week number two of On Cloud Nine. And this is looking f- towards uh, our nine-year anniversary Uh, next week, which is just, it it blows our mind. It's crazy what God's done in nine years. And and the announcement, like I I want to just share with you everything that I want to share next week because I'm just so excited about it, but I'm going to wait till next week. So come back next week, bring everybody you know, don't miss next week. I promise you don't want to miss it. It's going to be so exciting what we get to share with you uh, that God's doing. Um, But listen, when we started the church, we were in our house just sharing a vision of, man, we feel like God is calling us to uh, start a church. And we just got some friends around and we just shared with them and just told them, hey, this is what God's doing. Well, then the day came that uh, we were going to start and we were looking for a place. Where can we have church? And we found a school that was going to allow us to have church, Cedar Ridge Elementary over in Bixby. And uh, for two years, we sat up And tore down everything that we had in a gym in a little elementary over in Bigsby um, off Mingo uh, right there at Cedar Ridge Elementary. Every speaker we had, every light we had, we didn't have screens like we have now. Um, We had TVs, uh, but they were nice TVs, um, you know, that we had all the words on and everything like that. We had speakers that we would throw in a trailer and then every cable that had to be run. Like it's crazy. All the equipment we have now and everything like that. Like, uh, we thought we were cool because we set up a, a, a iPhone and that's how we recorded service. And, you know, it was awesome. And we just thought, man, we're recording service. Uh, it was terrible. I'm not going to lie. It was terrible. Uh, but, uh, man, God has, you know, just brought us so far over nine years. For two years, we were in that school. And uh, for those two years, we averaged 103 people. And uh, we thought we were just the king of the world and just amazed at what God was doing. And nine years later, uh, God has just been faithful and uh, he's been good, just like that song. Uh, I'm going to sing about the goodness of God. God's been good and, uh, and we are just blown away and we can't wait to celebrate with you. Uh, there's just milestones in life that you just like celebrating, uh, that you just like remembering. And uh, how we got started is one of those that we will never forget what God has done, where we were. Just a dream that God placed in our heart to where we are now and where we feel like God is taking us in the future is one of those things. Because listen, um, the future is a lot bigger and brighter than we can possibly imagine. I think what God wants to do um, is really exciting. But today I want to talk to you about the cloud of stress. Um, Does anybody deal with stress in here? Come on, somebody. I can't be the only one that has stress in life. Uh, life, Life is stressful, isn't it? Um, There's a lot of stress in in life. Here's what you have to understand. Uh, There's always something going on. And then when you get past that and you get that stress off your shoulders, there's another problem. There's always stress waiting for you. See, you get past one and then all of a sudden you got to pick something else up because it's right there. Um, You know, one, one thing that you have to understand is this. You're either coming out of a problem. You're either in a problem or you're fixing to go into a problem. And so I just want to encourage you a little bit this morning, uh, you know, and just bled like you either had a problem, you're having a problem or you're going to have a problem. And so, uh, you know, just feel good about that uh, as you leave today. Uh, just feel encouraged. But here's what I want you to understand. Here's what stress is. Stress is when the pressures of life 
are bigger than what you feel like your capacity to handle them is. That's stress. And so when, when the pressures of life and everything that you feel it is bigger than what you feel like, I don't think I can handle this anymore. I don't think I can carry this weight. I, I don't think I can do this anymore. It's just too big. It's too much. And so I've got good news and I've got bad news. There was a guy who went to the doctor and the doctor looked at him and said, sir, I have good news and I have bad news. And the guy says, well, doc, give me the good news first. And he says, absolutely. And he says, the good news is this. You have 24 hours to live. And the guy goes, what? How is that good news? And he said, well, I've been calling you since yesterday. That was the bad news. It's not good. So here's the thing. The bad news is this. You're always going to have pressure in life. You're always going to have stress. There's always going to be something. There's always going to be something around the corner. There's always going to be something that comes up. There's always going to be a weight that we have to carry. That's just life. But the good news is this. You do have more. You have more capacity inside of you. You have more ability to carry the stress that comes into your life than what you have. That's the good news. Yes, there's going to be stress in life. Yes, there's going to be pressure. There's going to be weight. But listen, you can take it. That's the good news. Philippians 4.13 says this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Listen, Paul wrote this when he was in prison. I don't know if any of you just woke up this morning and were like, I hope to go to prison today. It just sounds like fun. I think there's some good guys in there. You know, we could hang out. You get three meals a day. Like it could be, no, none of us do. But Paul finds himself in prison and Paul writes, listen, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here's what you have to understand. I can't control what happens to me. But with the help of God, I can control my response. Amen. There are some things in life that we just can't control. There are some things in life that come our way that we just have no control over. Listen, you get a call tomorrow, your boss calls you in and says, hey, the economy's not doing good. Budget's getting tight. I'm going to have to let you go. Listen, that's stress. That's out of your control, and that is stress. Listen, maybe you're driving around and your car breaks down. I don't know how many of you just have that car fund sitting aside that just you put it in the bank and you're like, this is for when the car breaks down. Most people don't have that. And so then that car breaks down and you've got this expense that's weighing over you. And so all of a sudden you have this stress on you. Maybe it's an unexpected medical expense that you have. You weren't expecting it, but all of a sudden you got sick. And then you know those, those bills can rack up really quickly. And then they call. They, they don't miss a call. They know how to get their money. Or maybe the doctor gives bad news. Or maybe you just get some bad news. And it just adds stress to your life. It's out of your control. But you just get some stress in your life. Maybe you were betrayed by somebody that you love. And maybe you just get some stress in your life. Listen, there are things in life that give us stress that are out of our control completely. But listen, there are also some things in our life that give us stress, that are in our control. We control that. I mean, let's be honest. A lot of us are giving ourselves self-inflicted stress wounds. We really are. Think about it. Think about your calendar. I mean, how many of you are just scheduling your day to make it as full as you possibly can? To cram as much stuff into your day as you possibly can? You, you just put everything in there and, and you just pile it on. And then you got kids on top of that. And then you got people who are like, hey, let's go to dinner. And, and then you got somebody else who, who's like, hey, let's go to dinner. And, and then you're going to dinner three times in one night because you just scheduled it that way. And, and then you, I, I've got four kids and maybe you've got one and your one kid's doing 19 things. So now I feel like I'm not being a good parent because I got to keep up with your 19 things that you're doing with your one kid, but I've got four kids. So now all of a sudden I've got to do 
76 different things on my schedule when you only have 19. Do you like that math? That's not Creek County math. It's from Oklahoma City. Came from Oklahoma City. Creek County, we would still be doing that math. But listen, maybe, maybe you, just, you just continue to add things because you're just like, well, if they're doing that, I got to do that. Well, if they're going to go to that place, then I need to go to that place. If they're going to be there, I need to do that. If their kids are doing that, then I need to do that. And all of a sudden, your calendar's just full. And all of a sudden, you have this stress on you because you're like, how are we going to get all this done? And it's like, hello. Take an eraser. Erase some things. You don't have to do everything to be a good parent. You don't have to do everything and be everywhere to be a good friend. You don't have to do everything and be everything to be a good person. Because here's the next, maybe you're a yes person. Anybody a yes person? My wife is a yes person. But the problem with my wife being a yes person is that makes me a yes person and I'm not a yes person. Because my wife volunteers me. I get voluntold what I'm doing. You know what I mean? I don't have a say in it. Somebody's like, hey, we're moving. Our family's not in town. We don't have anybody to help. And she's like, oh my gosh, Johnny would love to help you. Like, no, I wouldn't. No, I would rather shove needles in my eye. Like, I don't want to help you move. My truck broke down. But she just, it's yes to every, and maybe that's you. You can't say no, so you say yes to everything. Somebody's like, hey, you want to come over? Yes. You, you, you want to go, you know, over to this place? Let's go to dinner? Yes. You, you want to come help me? Yes. You, you want to do? Yes. And it's never no. And so the problem is because you can't say no, you've added all this stress on your life. And because you can't say no, you've added stress to other people's lives in your family. Because now your yes affects them. And so you've got to be able to say no. Maybe it's this. Maybe it's your debt. Maybe you, what you're bringing home and what you're spending is not adding up. Maybe what you're making, but then what you're spending is so much more. And you're like, I'm so thankful we have credit cards. Because I just get to put everything on credit cards and I don't have to think about it. And, and, and you just live be, because you begin to look at what everybody else is doing and you're trying to keep up with them. So you spend money, but yet your income doesn't match the way that you're spending. And so then that adds pressure. That adds stress. You know the number of people that Heather and I meet with for counseling? That when they sit down and we have this conversation, the conversation we have is because they're not managing money well. We have a friend from Oklahoma City that they go on vacation every year. And I mean, it's, it's an envious vacation. Like, it's awesome. <clears throat> but they put it on a credit card every year because they can't afford it. And so now they're about four years behind paying off their vacation, but they're planning their next year. I mean, tens, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 just on vacation. And it's awesome. And I'm like, I want to go with you. And you can put it on your credit card because I can't afford it. <laughs> but they can't afford it and they just do it and it adds this stress to them. Like, how are we going to pay this off? And I'm like, why are you going to a place you can't afford in the first place? Quit. Go camping. My wife will never, do, my, my wife is not a camper at all. She would rather stay home than go to a tent. I don't understand people that like camping. It's just not in me. Uh, it's not in my wife. Like, you know, I went once when I was a kid. It was about 140 degrees outside. And we were in a tent. And it was the worst experience of my life. I mean, the absolute. You sweat. You don't sleep. You sweat all night. There's a fan blowing on you. But it doesn't help. And people are like, I love camping. And I'm like, man, I don't at all. <laughs> but listen, you got to find things that you afford, not try to impress everybody with what you do. Maybe it's this, maybe it's social media. Can, confession, social media is an issue for me. I, I don't know why, but I can get sucked into those videos faster than anybody. I'm not even a builder, 
but a video will come on how to redo your back porch, how to redo your back deck. And I'll sit there and watch it and be like, I need to redo my back deck. I don't have a back deck, but I learned how to do it. So if you need a back deck redone, I got the video we can watch and do it together. I'm not like, I'm not a chef by any means, but I can't tell you the thousands of cooking videos that I've watched. And I send them all to Heather. I'm like, we're going to make this. I don't know how you make tofu good, but we're going to make, this looks amazing. You know, I'm, I've got a smoker. It's broke right now, but I don't even smoke, but I watch smoking videos all the time. And I'm like, oh, that looks so good. And I send them to Heather. All of Heather's feed is like food, 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 food. Let's make this. Let's make this. Let's make this. And I watch it all day long. And the next thing I know, I'm like, I'm sitting there and I've been scrolling for 30 minutes watching these dumb videos and just get sucked in. And then you have the stress because you're like, now I'm behind. I got to play catch up. Or maybe you're looking at social media and you're comparing everything that everybody else does. And you're looking at all the likes that people get. And you're like, I need more likes. I want people to love my videos. I want people to like me. I want people to love me. And then all of a sudden, because of that, it just creates this stress on you that you've created on yourself. So I'm not talking about that today. Because here's the thing, it's really, really simple. That part's really simple. Stop it. Let's pray. No, I'm joking. We're not praying. Like some of y'all bowed your head like, we're done? It's one point. Just stop. Quit doing what you're... Like if you're putting stress on yourself, a lot of people... Here, here's the thing. Here's, here's the people I meet. A lot of people that I meet just walk up and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed out. And then they begin to tell me and I'm like, you've done that to yourself. Stop it. Like quit complaining. Like you've made these decisions to put yourself in this situation. Stop it. Let's pray. Um, no, but here's the thing. I can't control everything, but I can control some things. Okay. I can't control everything. Not everything in my life can I can control, but there are some things that I can. That's what I want to look at today. Okay, let's look at those. So thought number one is this. I can't control everything, but I can run to God. I can't control everything, but I can run to God. Judson, he's our first boy. He's our third child. We had Addie and Haley, and then we had Judd, and then we had Jax. Um, And Judd was our third boy. And so came time for Judd to be born go to the hospital. Everything's going great. Everything's awesome. Um, and the delivery comes, the doctor takes Judd and lays it on, not it. I did this in the first, he's not an it. He's a person and we care for him and he's a great boy. Uh, he's not just a thing. Uh, and so laid him, uh, on her chest and you, you know, she just held him and was looking at him, and we're just looking at him, but there's something different. Like, I'm not an expert on delivery, but I've been through, at this point, two, and so it's kind of like, you know, I've stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. Like, I'm good. Uh, You you know, you kind of figure some things out. Some things need to happen. One of those things is this. When the baby comes out, you expect to hear something. He needs to cry. Like, every time they come out, both girls came out, And I mean, they were mad as a hornet when they came out. And for some reason, it stuck with them all these years. Uh, And so, you know, it's just like, like they're just mad. And so now Judd comes out laying on Heather's chest. We're looking at him. He's not making a sound. So the doctor's like, uh, you know, hey, Johnny, you want to cut the umbilical cord, umbilical cord, the cord that's connected. I can never get this right. Heather's like, that's not what it is. And so it's one of those things starts with an A. I think you, (laughs) man, golly, that's that Creek County spelling right there. My fault. I've been here too long. Starting to rub off on me, but, uh, (laughs) dead gummit starts with an A. Why did I even say that? I didn't need to go to spelling. Spelling's not my strong suit by any means. Like you ever read my, my messages, my notes or anything like spelling is not it. It's got that swervy underlined on a ton of stuff, but I know what it means. And so, uh, so I just leave it and roll on. But, and so they were like, you want to cut this? And I was like, yes. And so the nurses are standing around and you can kind of see their eyes and their eyes are a little big. And they're like, 
doctor, we need to hurry. And so Heather and I are just kind of looking. And so she's like, hey, cut this real quick. And so I cut it real quick. And as soon as I do, the nurses grab Judd and they take him over. And I mean, they just start going crazy with him. They grab him by his feet and they're swinging him. Like it's crazy. They're slapping him. They're hitting his back as hard as they can. I'm like, good grief, man. Slapping him on the face and everything. And there's nothing. And so Heather and I, at this point, we knew something's not right. And so about that time, I'm standing by her head, and all of a sudden, that, that noise you don't want to hear, that sound you don't want to hear, they, they, they hit the alarm, and it's just code blue, code blue, code blue. And, um, and, and so we're standing there. I'm standing next to her head, and they, there's about 100 nurses that rush into the room. They bring crash carts in and everything like that. And you go from this moment of exhilaration the baby's here. Like we've been whispering to it. We've been talking to it. We've been so excited to meet him for the first time. And, and now he's here too. What in the world is going on? That's stress. That's stress. It's what we go through. All of a sudden, one moment it's going great. And then the next moment, all of a sudden it feels like everything's falling. The bottom's falling out. And we have all this pressure just leaning on us and laying on us. And it's just so heavy on us. And we've got this stress. So they rush it in, and I'm up by Heather's head, and there's only when I, it's almost like a go-to, just when I don't know what to do, and when a situation is going on that's just out of our control, my prayer is just, God, you are good, and I trust you, and I'm right by her head, and she's just crying, and I'm just crying, because he's not breathing, and it's like, God, you are good. And I trust you. And she's just looking, is he going to be okay? And God, you are good. And I trust you. And right about that time, they're getting the paddles ready, fixing to shock him. And right about that time, I mean, they've been doing CPR and everything. Right about that time, all of a sudden, just, you just hear this big just cry. Just that brings just, you're just like, oh my goodness. But listen, where do you go? When you find yourself with the weight of stress on your life. Listen, I want to encourage you when that weight comes, run to God and run to good people. Run to God when that weight comes. Don't carry it on your own. Here's the thing. One of the worst things that you can do is isolate yourself. I should be able to handle this. I should be able to do this. I should be able to get through this. I, 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 I shouldn't be feeling this way. I should be able to deal with this. And so then what do we do? We pull ourselves back and we begin to isolate ourselves from God and from people. And that's one of the worst places that you and I can get. Look at what Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10 says this. It says two are better than one because they have good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other one up. But it says pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. How many of you are walking through life right now with some stress, but yet you don't have anybody there? How many of you are walking through life right now and you're not turning and running to God? Listen, in that moment, I couldn't get words out I mean, it's that cry where snot's running down and just the eyes, and you can just, it's just a blubber, but it's just like, God, you are good, and I trust you. Because the only place I knew to go was I was going to run to God. I was going to run to Him. Because when that weight comes, I know that God, you're good. Even though the situation's not. God, you're still good. And I'm running to Him. Listen, here's the thing. This is the reason we have groups. The reason we have small groups in church is because we take a big church with a lot of people and we make it smaller and we make it relational. Walking through the doors and just saying, hey, how are you? Missed you. I haven't seen you in a week. Giving them a hug and just, you know, man, hope things are great. That's not relational. That's surface that's not what we were created for. We weren't created for that. We were created to go deeper, to have somebody look at us and go, no, 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 no. Really, how are you doing? Amen. No, I see something going on. R really, what's going on inside? 
really, I know you're dealing with these things and I know this stuff is on your shoulder and I know you've got a lot of stress and weight going on right now. What can I do? How can I help? But the problem is, here's the problem. A lot of times we turn to the wrong people. Let's be honest. Some of you are going to get information and you're going to get help, but the problem is they're not helping. They're adding more stress because they're giving the wrong advice. My, my parents made a movie about my sister after she passed away. And in that movie, my brother makes this statement. He says, it is so frustrating talking to my dad. And he goes, I, and I, he goes this sounds weird. He goes, but it's so frustrating. He goes, because any time you have a problem and you go to my dad, all he's going to do is take you to scripture. He goes, sometimes I just want, you know, just tell me they're an idiot. You know, just tell me, you know, that I'm right and they're wrong. But he's always going to take you to scripture. You need friends that are going to point you back to Jesus. You don't need friends that are just going to come and just gang up and get on your side and just continue to just load that stress on you and just feed that fire that's inside of you of frustration and stress. You need some friends that are going to speak truth into your life. And here's the thing. Sometimes that truth is not what you want to hear, but it's what you need to hear. That's a good friend. That's the kind of friend that you need. And so thought number two is this. I can't control everything, but I can worship. Come on, this is so good. So many times, listen, I, I don't need the band up here to worship. Can I tell you how many times I've just sat in my car and I'll be sitting at a light. Man, I'm singing a song and I'm just crying like just a baby and snot's coming down my nose and I look over and the person next to me is like, I did you got it, it's just good. It does my heart, I'm not weird. Because you're just like, man, I, I needed this moment. There's some things going on and I, I needed this moment. I, need, I needed these words. I needed this song. I, I needed to worship. They don't know what I'm going through. They don't know the weight that I'm carrying. They don't know the stress that's on my life. They don't know what I'm walking through. And I just need this moment with God right now. And maybe that moment is in the car. Maybe that moment is just at home. My mom used to turn on the Gaithers and the cathedrals all the time through the house. She'd just turn it on and just blare it. And we just walk through the house and we just worship. You don't know, if you don't know who the Gaithers, well, no, no. If you know who the Gaithers are in the cathedrals, you're old. <laughs> We're old. I know who they are. We're old. If you don't, you're young. But, but listen, you turn it on and you just begin to worship. Man, I got a speaker in the bathroom. We turn worship music on, get in the shower, and I'll just be crying and worshiping, you know, taking a shower. You can find those moments where I've got this stress and I just, God, I just need to worship. I need to get the focus off me and I need to get the focus on you. And I need to look to you in this moment. It says this, Isaiah 53, 3, he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Can I tell you this? So many times I meet with people and they're going through hard times. They're going through death. They're going through struggles. They're going through pain. And I show up and they're crying. And most of the time they're like this, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I'm crying. And I'm like, why? Why are you sorry? Don't, don't, be, don't apologize. Grief is a part of life. It's natural. You love them. You have a connection with them. You have a relationship with them. Don't apologize for feeling something. That's good. Look at what it says. Psalm 61, 1 says this. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. And it says this, from the end of the earth, I cry to you. And then it says this, when my heart is overwhelmed, when stress is on me, okay? When I feel the stress of the world, when my heart just feels overwhelmed, what do you and I do? It says this, lead me to the rock that is higher. Man, when I feel that pressure, what do I need to do? I'm going to turn to God and I'm going to begin to worship. God, I need to see the rock that's bigger and higher than me. I'm going to turn to the rock because right now I've got this stress. I've got this pressure. And some of you walk into the room and you just need, when, man, when those songs come on, when the truth of the worship begins to happen and you begin to just sing those words, God just begins to just lift that stress and that weight off your shoulders a little bit and something changes because we worship. Listen, I love, listen, you, you have to understand, 
We can't rely on feelings. We have to trust in truth. I can't trust my feelings. My feelings will lie to me. I've got to trust in the truth of who God is and worship gets me back to the truth. Because just like the song we sang, and all my life you have been faithful. All my life. Listen, even when Judd was in the hospital, even when it didn't look good, and all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. Even when the situation of life doesn't look good, even when what I'm walking through doesn't seem good, but God is still good. When I have that stress on, God is still good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Maybe you just need to worship. Maybe when that stress gets heavy, you just need to turn some songs on. You just need to get by yourself. You just need to go to the closet. You need to crank that music up. You need to tick the neighbors off. You need to get the bass going. And you just need to feel it in your chest. And you just need to begin to proclaim the truth through worship. Thought number three. I can't control it. But I can focus on eternity. Jeremiah 20, 18 says this. Why? Why was I born? Was it only to have trouble and sorrow? To end my life in disgrace? Matthew 27, 46 says this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus asked why on the cross. Do you know we're going to have a lot of why moments in life? Do you know that? Do you know we're going to have those moments of I don't understand? Jesus is on the cross and at the moment that sin fell on him, you can imagine the weight that Jesus had. Sin fell on him and at the moment of his greatest need, what happened? His father turned his back on him. Why? Because God rejects sin and Jesus knew going to the cross that was the payment and the burden that he was going to have to carry. But he's saying, God, why? I need you. Why? Listen, we're going to have a lot of why moments in life. I had a guy after the first service come up to me and he said, Pastor, he said, I had a friend pass away when I was young. He said, I've been asking the question why for 37 years and I've never got it. He said, today I did. Because here's what you have to understand about the question why. And it's, You have to know that God is at work even when you can't see it. God's at work. But here's the thing. I may never know why, but when I do know why, I'm going to be okay with it. Because here's the thing. This world is not our home. Eternity is. And this side of heaven, we may not ever get the answers. This side of heaven, we may never be able to understand why did this happen. You know, we, we as a family struggled with this. My sister was 39 years old, had seven kids from the age of four to 14 when she passed away from cancer. She was a better parent than I'll ever be. She loved people. When she was going through chemo, she would bring cookies up and she would walk around to everybody else while she's getting chemo. And, and with the IV in her arm and everything like that, she'd pull that thing around, pass out cookies and share Jesus with people. Like she, I mean, she was incredible. At one point, I, I wasn't there, but my dad and my brother were. They were next to her bed, and she was out because the pain was so bad. So they had given her just all, all this medicine in, in order to just really just keep the pain from just being too terrible for her. And she was out. And all of a sudden, the doctor walks in, and she wakes up like, like a miracle wake up. And she wakes up, and she rolls over, and she grabs that doctor's hand, and she says, Oh, doctor. All I want is for you to know Jesus. All I want is for you to get saved. And she lets go of his hand. She rolls back over and she goes to sleep. Like just this, this holy moment. Like she was incredible. And then there's other people that we know. And we're like, God, why not them? Like they're terrible. 
They're terrible to their kids. They're terrible to their family. They don't care about anybody. They're awful. She was incredible making such a difference. Why her? Can I be honest? Look at what this says. I got this from a pastor, Chris Hodge. He says, I may never know why, but when I do know why, I will be okay with it. First John says this, that when we see Jesus face to face, our eyes will be opened. When I get to eternity, I may never have the answers this side of heaven. But when I get to eternity and I look God face to face in the eyes and I see him and he tells me why, listen, in that moment, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be like, yes, I, I understand. I'm fine with that. I wouldn't change a thing. Look at what he also said. He said this. He said, God, you were always there. You were always at work and you always did the right thing. Can I be honest with you? When we get to heaven, on this side of heaven, we may ask why, but when we get to heaven, we're going to look at God and we're going to say, God, that was the right thing. This struggle that I'm going through, this pain that I went through, this heartache, this stress that I went through, that was the right thing and I'm okay with it. I wouldn't go back and change anything. You made every right decision because when we see him face to face on that side of eternity, we're going to look and go, you are God and I am not. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of all the praise and I am not. And the decisions that you have made and the things that have happened this side of heaven, God, you always did what was right. That's hard. But listen, we have to. Get to that place to where when we are walking through stress, our eyes are not on this situation. Our eyes are on eternity. I'm not looking here. I'm looking up towards Jesus. Number four. I can't control everything. But here's what I can do. I can trust God. Can't control everything. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will direct your paths. Faith falls apart when we think that if I follow God, nothing bad will ever happen to me. Life is going to have stress. Life is going to have pain. Life is going to have struggles. Did you know, we've, we've all heard the serenity prayer. We've all, you probably have... You know, a necklace, a shirt, or something that you bought at some point, sometime you've read it. But look at what it is. I never knew it was as long as it was. I always thought it was God grant me the serenity to what? Accept the things I can't change. What is that? Self-induced stress. Or no, that's stress. That's stress. Accept the things that I can't change. And the courage to change the things that I can't. Self-induced stress. That's what it is. I've got stress I can't do anything about. And then I've got stress I put on myself. And the wisdom to know the difference. That's it. It's as far as it goes. That's all we ever know. That's all we ever see. But it goes so much farther and it's so incredible. I never knew this was here. It says living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as part, uh, 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 as a pathway to peace. My stress is going to lead to peace. And then it says, Taking, as Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. I wouldn't have chosen this path. I wouldn't have chosen this pain. I wouldn't have chosen this hurt. I wouldn't have chosen this direction. But God, you did. And so now, because of that, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to you. I might not have chosen this, but God, I trust you. It's not the path that I would have picked, but God, I trust you so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in heaven. So here's the thing. If I surrender to him, trust him, I didn't choose this path, but if I trust you, I can be happy. Even in stress, even in pain, I can be happy this side of heaven. And then when I get to eternity, oh, there's a joy that is undescribable. 
There's a happiness that I cannot explain waiting for me on the other side of eternity. Isn't that good? Thought number five, I can't control everything, but I can learn from life's situation. God doesn't create problems, but God uses problems. And he doesn't create them. See, only God gives good and perfect gifts that come from above. But he will use the pain and the suffering. Romans 5, 3 says this, Not only so, but we also glory in suffering because we know that suffering produces. Something comes from the pain that we're going through, from the stress that we're going through. Perseverance, character, and hope. That's what comes from perseverance, character, and hope. If I preserve myself, if I get through it, then God begins to change me from the inside. My character begins to change. And with that character, hope begins to take place. So my situation isn't a jail of imprisonment, but it's a school that shapes me. I'm not in prison because I'm in this situation. And sometimes it feels that way. If you've ever had a heart, you feel like, but it's not. It's not a prison. Listen, it's a school that's shaping you. I can't change everything, but listen, I can grow through it. Can't change everything, but I can always grow. Thought number six is this. I can't change everything, but I can use my pain to help others. 1 Corinthians 1, 3 says this. Praise be to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Father of compassion and the God of comfort, who comforts us in our troubles. God comforts us. And now look at what God wants us to do. So that we can comfort those in trouble. And with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So we go through pain, we go through stress, and then what happens? God comes and God does what only God can do to us. So then when we see somebody else going through something else, something similar to what we've done, what do we do? We show up and we help them through it because we've been there and we know and we understand. I understand what you're going through. I see it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to help. I'm going to help you get through this. Victor Franco is a Holocaust survivor. He's an author and he's a psychiatrist. And he's a Jew from uh, Vienna. And his family was all of his family was killed by the Nazis. He was the only one that survived. And after all of that was over, he went back to Vienna and he picked up his practice where he left off. When he began to see patients again, they were all Jews who had gone through the Holocaust and they were all struggling with suicide. Every one of them. But the interesting thing is, by the end of his treatment, not one of his patients ever committed suicide. See, Sigmund Freud has this idea that life is all about pleasure. Just find pleasure. Just make yourself happy. Find things that make you happy. Do those things. That's what life is about, just being happy. And after the experience that Viktor Franco had with the Holocaust... He realized that can't just be true because there's, there's too much pain and the pleasure that I'm trying to find can't mask the pain that's inside of what I've experienced. And so there's not a vacation that's going to go that's going to take this pain away. You know, there's not something that I can buy that's going to take this pain away. The pain is too deep and it hurts too much. And so he was at conflict with this thought That life is just about pleasure and finding pleasure. And that's when he really discovered. He said, life, the greatest life is not about pleasure. The greatest life is about finding your true purpose. That's what life is truly about. And here's what he said. He said, if you don't have purpose, you will dull your life with pleasure. If you don't have purpose, then what you're trying to do is you're trying to create experiences that give you pleasure in order to hide the fact that you really don't live with purpose. And so he created this therapy called the the logo therapy. 
And he created three things in order for each of these, uh, each of his clients that he was seeing. The first one is this, and all these come from the Bible. He didn't create this. The Bible did. It says this, everybody needs meaningful work. Not just a job to do. Everybody needs meaningful work, purposeful work. Everybody needs a community of friends. And everybody has to learn to take their pain and help somebody else. Listen, what you've been through, somebody else needs your help. Your struggle, your pain, your stress, somebody else needs the encouragement that there is another side, that they can get through it, that they can see a, 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 sun, a, 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 a sunny day again. Everything's not doom and gloom and cloudy. But there are brighter days ahead. And that's because of you and the testimony that you carry with, with the struggle and the pain that you've walked through. And so here's just for us to remember. I can't control everything. But I can run to God and run to others. We need good friends and we need to turn to God. I can't control everything. But I can worship. I can get on my knees and I can begin to worship God. I can't control everything but I can focus on eternity. I, I, this world is not my home. I was never created in, in order to be here. I, I was created for God and God alone. And eternity is my future. Heaven is my home. I, I can't control everything, but I can trust God. I can't control everything, but I can learn from life situation. I can't control everything, but I can use my pain to help others. Listen, we're all going to go through stress. We're all going to have the weight of the world on us. But it's how you handle it that matters. How do you walk through it? Listen, if you will use these six principles, here's what I can promise you. The weight will get lighter. It will. It will never go away. But it can get lighter. Because your capacity has grown. Will you pray with me?